Hi, Jacob Kaluzny here and welcome to Instant Threat Modeling. Today's five minute video is on video conferencing. Teams, Skype, Zoom, Jitsi, there is heaps of video conferencing software, commercial or open source, cloud or on-premise, but they all share a similar model. Peer-to-peer -peer didn't get much traction. We need a server. There are multiple users that authenticate with some credentials or just meeting ID. And usually there is a SIP component, allowing people to dial in using phones. Now, the biggest difference between the on-prem and cloud is the ownership of the server. So where do we put the trust boundary? Who can attack the system? Now, in software as a service solution, such as Zoom or cloud-based Teams, the server is owned by a third party and located somewhere on the internet. Both external attackers and the cloud owner are in a position to attack the system. So we've got the third party here and external attackers. There are on-premise solutions that are owned by the meetings organizer company but still the server is reachable from the internet, it is exposed, then the external attack is applied. And the last case is an on-prem solution, but only for internal communication. So the server is owned by the meetings organizer company, and the only people that can connect to the video conference are the employees. And then we have the last threat, the last threat actor here. What can go wrong here? Well, joining somebody's meeting is definitely a threat. Collection of personal data such as call history or maybe even the recordings. So-called Zoom bombing, so uh, disruption of an ongoing call. How technically this could happen? Unless the communication is encrypted end-to-end, -end, and I mean customer end to customer end, the server owner will always be able to eavesdrop the connection. So we've got the man in the middle here. If the server is exposed to the internet, it always has an external attack surface. So excessive services, um, default passwords, obsolete software, any video streaming, um, web authentication or dial-in service on the server connected to the internet can be searched for vulnerabilities. And there has been a history of uh, remote code execution uh, in the video conferencing software. So dial-in methods are the best target for brute forcing. Numeric meeting IDs and passwords are much easier to guess. So we've got a brute force here. Personal rooms. I've seen people setting up meetings with the same meeting ID and the same password all the time. Think about it. Having been invited once, you can always dial in at a different time to a different meeting. Once connected, the video conferencing platforms allow sharing files. Uploading a malicious file, such as uh, remote code execution payload or just malware, can be very harmful. People got used to very intuitive interfaces of uh, multiple video conferencing platforms. Very often when you join a new platform, when you click on the meeting invite, you're asked to install additional software, very often from the organizer's web page. This is a perfect lure for a phishing campaign. Instant mitigations. Either accept the risk or switch to on-prem. Any system exposed to the internet should follow a base threat model uh, for external service. This should include a least privileged principle, uh, no excessive ports opened, no default passwords, regular update policy. Introduce limits based on IP addresses or phone numbers. Don't use personal rooms. Always rotate the meeting IDs and passwords. If you don't, at least confirm that all of the people that joined the call are authorized to do so. Verify files that um, come from sources that are not trusted and, well, keep your software up to date. Before installing any new video conferencing software, um, at least run it through VirusTotal or execute it in a virtual machine. This was instant threat modeling of video conferencing software. I hope your one is secure, but I'm always happy to discuss your case. Cheers.